so what advice, um, if I start, you have with the idea first come around with the film, um, how would you develop the entire project? Well, it, in a slightly complex way, it was based on a, it was very loosely based on a play that we've done together at university, which was far too expensive to make into a film. It was a burning house, there was a helicopter that fell off the roof, um, and basically when we decided to make this film, we just started adapting it into something that would be much more easily achieved. <laughs> and um, how easy is it? Well, certainly, it's, it's not an easy film to have two directors. You know, like how hard is it to kind of come up with a, a creative shared vision? Uh, well, in this film, we had a crew of four, so it was. I mean, to be honest, it, everyone was doing everything. It was if you weren't, if you were an actor and you weren't required on set, you were helping to make sandwiches. And uh, if you had five minutes as a director, while well, they were changing the battery in the camera, you would be driving Colin from the station. Uh, so it was, it was kind of just on a scrap. <laughs> it wasn't really like we had tactics. It was basically just, um, so this needs to be done, who is free to do it? And so I guess we didn't really think about that too much on this occasion. So basically, in the industry is so, I guess. I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> it's poor <laughs> spirit. <laughs> and um, obviously, these are quite young. You're young for the yeah. uh, creation of the feature film. And um, I mean, how hard was it to get people interested in, in kind of getting involved and in maybe investing? Because um, obviously, when, when you are so young, it's hard to. I'm assuming you're a filmmaker yourself, so it's kind of like kind of through this process of producing. So I know it's kind of hard to get people on board when you don't have much of a track record to prove yourself. So how hard was it finding people to support you and kind of get the film made? Well, we, um, well, basically, we, the, the only reason we were sort of arrogant enough to make a film in the first place is a production company was going to give us 50 grand to make a, a film which we got really excited about so immediately went off and uh, like developed a script and then they didn't give us the 50 grand and so we, uh, <laughs> so then uh, by that stage we were so excited about it that we uh, we dropped the already low budget uh, down to what we thought we could do for 20 grand and um, we started basically writing to lots of well just everyone we knew and some kind of people gave us uh, some money some friends gave us some money we ended up putting in uh, money when the film went dramatically over its 20 grand budget to 25 grand. Uh, so that was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a tough thing, but mainly just by basically you know, doing everything ourselves was uh, how we spent money. At every stage we thought that we could stop making the film and someone else was, would spray this or, or do the proper final sound effects or something like that. Or uh, basically that, that day never came. But we learned a lot by doing it. Um, Chris, um, how did you get involved with the project? How, how were you approached? Well, it, it's kind of an answer to your previous question, which is, you know, how, how, do, you, how do they get people involved? And, and for me, what it was was um, that I, I got sent a script. I did, I didn't, I'd not met Will, or I didn't know Will or, or, or Tom. And, um, and I, you know, I, I write as well, so I, you know, I know about scripts a, a bit, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I, I read a lot of scripts, and um, I was just really knocked out with it. I, I, it, was, it was exceptional, I thought. It was kind of bittersweet, and fragile and, um, and uh, very understated and very delicate and very mature, but it's, it was very, um, I found it very moving, you know, funny and, and moving, and so that was, the, that was the hook for me was that, and then, and then I met the guys, we had a meeting, I think three of us in an office somewhere, I think, yeah. and, uh, and, and just uh, as soon as I started talking with them, you know, I'm, I'm probably not, uh, uh, you know, my, my career never been particularly well founded but um, you know I, I, I have to go on just what I feel sometimes and I just met these guys and I really wanted to spend more time with them and if making the film was the way I, I get to, to do that because they
they just were interesting and engaging and, and funny and bright and that. And uh, it's it was and it was kind of, there was that sort of thing of when someone kind of says do you, you know do you want to be in our gang? Uh, yeah yeah go on take me yeah take me along I, I, yeah because um, it just sounded like it was an it was an odd and uh, it was quite a touching thing really with people who have you know have no um, none of the sort of normal traditional like a huge budget behind them or a big producer behind them or a distribution deal or anything <laughs> but it was their enthusiasm for their own idea that I found completely you know intoxicating and and uh, I wanted to I wanted to share that enthusiasm and obviously you've done uh, some bigger things in the past as well um, I mean like how does going uh, no actually I haven't really? no no well, I mean, I, well, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, perhaps, uh, well, perhaps more established directors and um, people who've had far more experience in terms of, I mean, I'm sort of thinking in particular of, uh, well, like certainly like with David Bird and like working with Mario Minucci, who's been established for many years. Like, um, what's it kind of like work going from that to working with people who, who essentially are close to just were really excited about this project and so we just all got together and I'm not claiming any responsibility for it because it's their project but we all thought yeah let's just do this and get it done and, and I was one of the most um, exciting things for me and I'd, I'm, I'm sure Colin you agree with this is that um, not only were there those kind of suits from the front office coming in and saying you know we need to have more car crashes or whatever but um, th there was this, this completely ego environment, um, which was because of how Will and Tom are, and so, um, you know, what I, uh, as a, a friend of mine once said to me, um, I have all the answers, because one of the answers I have is I don't know, and, uh, and you know, that, that they worked very much, they were always asking everybody what they thought of everything, and instead of bogging it down in, in sort of committee, <laughs> what happened is, we were all on the same page, we all knew what we wanted, we were all determined way possible and so you know I, I it never occurs to me it's a low budget film it was a, it was some really beautiful work uh, executed and, and inspired by two really fantastically creative people so I mean uh, do you agree yeah, I'll, Colin, you, yeah. Colin, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll second what Chris said yeah. <laughs> 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 I said too much um, no it was just a joy um, you know lovely lovely nice lovely people gentle feel, wasn't it, Chris? It was, you know, we we turn up, we get, we'd get to the house somehow around about ten o'clock, and they'd say, "Have you had breakfast?" And you'd go, "Well, I've had a bit, but it's a while back now." And so we'd always say, "Let's get breakfast going first." And, you know, the, the downside, it all been very nice like that. You know, well, the upside is you get fed, but the downside was like at four o'clock the following morning, you're still filming. You know, so, um, but uh, that was just the joy. I, I, I've never really, I've, I've done like bits of telly. And sensible meals like 
pasta with pesto on it or shepherd's pie and occasionally even some cake and then by the end we had all sort of gone a little bit hysterical and we were having dinner at 4 30 in the morning and it was beetroot soup with pureed garlic and things like this <laughs> and so that was kind of the descent from we're going to do this properly like grown-ups to let's just try and do something so that there's something on the come by the end of the week also that's the, the spaghetti bolognese that you see on the film at the end was uh, that fed the crew for the next day it was just on the table just being kicked at it was really uh, people just can't eat I, I can't eat that also it was very uh, futuristic <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions? that he's dead 
at the end of the film, or you could imagine that he's about to die. The one thing that we did need to do was um, when we go to Blake's house, there's a shot that we were really careful to get of him picking up some pills because some people didn't get that he had killed himself. So that was the only th sort of decision we made about Blake's death in terms of kind of tactical decision, I guess. Yeah, but we did, the, we did like, the camera in the, in the rush is, does linger on, on Colin when he's just sitting there for a while, but we just decided it was maybe it was stronger to play off uh, other people. The, yeah, the other thing that happened was that Colin knew he had to die by just sitting there, and so he got very still. And genuinely, some of the feedback from the early edits was, you can tell that you freeze-framed that. So, you know, it's not interesting. We, we but we hadn't freeze-framed it. That was just Colin sitting still. So <laughs> we, had to, <laughs> we, had to, we sort of had to cut away because people thought we were cheating when, when Colin wasn't cheating. Also, that, that whole scene, there was an edit of the film where uh, Colin does his speech, and he did it just fantastically, like, like probably 12 times in a row at, at Vistas, which was on our four in the morning day. And he, uh, like, the whole scene could play on one shot, and we kept it in on one five-minute shot, uh, which, which is too much. So we, we, we had to cut away. But he did do the whole thing in, in one shot. And I, just I have to say just, um, that when we, were sh when we were filming, Colin kept saying, oh, sorry, I've got to go away and do my dinner table speech. And we'd see him sort of walking among trees in the distance, kind of you know, muttering to himself. And, and we'd never rehearsed this scene. As I said, we made spaghetti... And we sat down to eat spaghetti, and that, all that conversation about um, uh, was it Katie not having a glass and, and Boy's shrine was just, it just came out, just improvised stuff. And then the doorbell rang, and then Amanda went out to get um, Colin, and Colin came in and sat at the table, and, and he just did the speech. And we'd never heard it before. We, we were aware of it being in the script, obviously. And at the end of the first time he did it, we were all in tears. Everyone around the table just uh, just completely fell apart because it was so affecting, you know. And uh, it was just it was really it was like that that thing that makes theatre kind of a, an odd thing is that you're kind of you're in the room with the creature itself, you know. And it was really something just being in the room with the thing itself. Uh, and we were all, you know, we were very unprofessionally burst into tears. Because <laughs> 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 he's very he's very good. Um, yeah. Um, I'm afraid I just didn't give the signal that we're out of time. So um, thank you all for coming and can we have a big round of applause for the passengers. <laughs>